Hey, Carrie. Do you mind if we start? I don't mind. Thank you. All right. <laughs> I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order our, our first uh, ever and very exciting uh, subcommittee. And so first, what we have to do uh, is the clerk is going to read in the letter from Chair Rogers. Madam Clerk. A letter from State Representative Julie Rogers dated January 17th, 2023 to Mr. Rich Brown Clerk, Michigan House of Representatives. Dear Mr. Clerk, I hereby appoint the following members of the 102nd Legislature to the Subcommittee on Behavioral Health of the Standing Committee on Health Policy for the 2023-2024 Legislative Session. Representative Brabeck, Chair. Representative Arbit, Majority Vice Chair. Representatives Reingans, McDonnell, Edwards, Pahutsky, Glanville, Schmaltz, Minority Vice Chair. Hoadley, St. Germain, Thompson. Sincerely, Representative Julie Rogers, Chair, Health Policy Committee. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Would you please now take attendance? Chair Brabeck. Here. Representatives Arbit. Present. Pahutsky. Present. Glanville. Present. Edwards. Present. McDonald. Present. Rangans. Present. Small. Here. Hoadley. Present. St. Germain. Here. Thompson. Present. Madam Chair, you have 11 members present. You do have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Representative Arbit moves to adopt Thursday at 9 a.m. in room 519 of the House Office Building as the normal day, time, and location of the House Health Policy Committee. Will the clerk please take the vote? Yeah, of course. Just give me a second. No problem. Arbit. Okay. To adapt the day, time, and location, Chair Brabeck. Yes. Representatives Arbit. Yes. Pahutsky. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Edwards. Yes. McDonald. Yes. Rangans. Yes. Schmaltz. Yes. Holy. Yes. St. Germain. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Madam Chair, you have 11 yeas, zero nays, zero pass. The motion is adopted. Thank you, Madam Clerk. The House Health Policy Subcommittee on Behavioral Health will follow the uniform committee rules stated in the House standing rules that were adopted on the House floor. So those are the organizational items that we have before us today, uh, team. But what I'd like to do now before we hear from our presenters is uh, this topic uh, is very important. A lot of us are very passionate about this topic, and I would really love to hear from all of you uh, why you uh, wanted to be on the subcommittee, what you're hoping uh, to get, and the things that are interest that you're passionate about in the realm of mental health care. Uh, I know that um, obviously we have our presenters here, so we want to be able to give them enough time. So if you could keep your marks uh, brief on the brief side, uh, that would be great, so we can get through. Um, everyone, but I would really like not only for myself to hear that, but for our, our entire team uh, as we're working here. So, Majority Vice Chair, I'd love for you to start. Thank you, thank you, Chair Brayback, and I'm just so grateful for your leadership and and to be here with uh, all my fellow members of the committee. Um, you know, I'm I'm one of the younger members of the legislature, um, and uh, I've been through my own fair share of struggles related to mental health. And I know that I would not be here if it weren't for the resources and opportunities that I had to ensure that those struggles weren't sentences. But that just isn't the case for far too many people across our state. And the fact that we have people in the state of Michigan who lack access to critical mental health care, that's a policy choice that we make. And I think it's time we made a different one. And so that's why I'm really excited to be part of this committee um, and under your leadership, Chair Brabeck. So. I'm really excited about the work that, that we're going to be able to do to help everyone, you know, live up to their fullest potential. So. Thank you, Chair. Representative Pahutsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm very, <clears throat> excuse me, passionate about behavioral health because uh, someone I love was uh, unfortunately not given those resources that, you know, Rep Arbit talked about and that, that I've been fortunate to have, too. Uh, she was someone who 
slip through the cracks. And, and I remember watching kind of the, the band-aids that everyone threw her way to, to try and uh, make it make things sustainable and, and try to do the best they could. Uh, and then serving in my first two terms on health policy, seeing how widespread, you know, it feels very personal when it's happening to you, but seeing how widespread that is and also how it looks different regionally. Uh, you know, depending on rural areas, urban areas. We all have similar challenges, but they look very different all across the state. So uh, I'm very passionate about this work, and I'm really looking forward to uh, getting down to business, especially mm -hmm. under your leadership. So thank you. Thank you, Representative, Representative Glanville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my interest in this topic um, comes from my um, career in having worked in education um, with many, many different populations um, across many, anyway, uh, so a wide expanse of populations. And one of the things that I have come to realize is there's a real failure in our healthcare system in that mental health has never received. We are whole people, and yet we have been very uh, lax in treating the mental health um, aspect of our healthcare um, needs across, you know, regardless of who you are and what your, your particular needs are. So I'm looking for, in this committee, I'm hoping that we can move the needle on parity mm -hmm. in the way that folks um, not only receive treatment, but have access to treatment, how it's paid for by insurance, um, those kinds of things. So i um, looking forward to really digging into getting this work done and grateful for your leadership in this, um, in this committee. Thank you. Thanks, Rep. Glanville. Rep. Edwards. Good morning. Um, well, I am a limited license master social worker with experience in child welfare, such as foster care, adoption, and children aged out of foster care. I also have experience working in the hospital setting and CMH, which is community mental health. So I work with adults and children and seniors with mental illness. So this um, topic is very important to me, as you can tell from my background and my experience, as well as personal um, things as well. So I'm looking forward to the things that we discuss here, and I want to continue that we focus on things that will assist the patients, assist the vulnerable population, as opposed to penalizing them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rep. Edwards. Rep. McConnell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm very happy to be in this committee and that it exists in the first place. I agree that one of the most important um, issues that we face is access, especially economic access to mental health care. In my case, um, someone very dear to me has been hospitalized maybe a dozen times over the past six years. And um, the beds, there are so few available beds. People are waiting in emergency rooms for 38 hours, 72 hours, weeks even longer. Um, so we really need to have more mental health um, bed, beds in Michigan. Also, I think one of the few opportunities, if I, I don't know if I can say positives, about the epidemic we're facing right now is that I think there's a bit of a lessening of the shame mm -hmm. that younger people are so accustomed mm -hmm. to their friends and family mm -hmm. um, having and being adjacent to or having themselves mental health issues, that it's not something to be ashamed of anymore. It's something we just need help for. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And Rep. Ryan. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, first, I want to say that it's an honor to be on a committee chaired by a person who has a doctorate of clinical psychology and still practices today. I know that you will bring your um, technical expertise, but also your daily work experience um, to this committee, and I'm very happy to be on this committee with you. Um, I myself uh, am trained in social work, and my husband is a licensed clinical social worker at a rural hospital here in Michigan. Um, previously, he worked at the Washtenaw County Community Mental Health Agency in a variety of programs, including in the crisis this area. Um, my mom herself died of addiction three months before my daughter was born. And addiction runs throughout my family and other mental health issues run throughout my family and community. Um, I know that we can work together on this committee for these two years to address policies that can really enable the expansion of mental health and uh, addiction and behavioral health services, and I'm honored to work with people who are passionate and who know themselves um, from family experiences and living as members of our communities just how much work we have to do. And I think we can take a big bite out of this apple this this um, two years in this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Minority Vice Chair Smoltz. Okay. Um, thank you. 
Uh, we all know people who struggled with mental health, and we all know that it's getting worse. And I agree with the other people on the panel here talking about um, access. Mm -hmm. That's a really important thing we need to do. Um, my main concern is working with young people and dealing with our young people and making sure that they have places to go for mental health services and that they're, they can get all of this out so it doesn't fester and fester into adulthood. Also, social media, the aspects of that mm -hmm. on mental health is so important. We really have to deal with that and, of course, substance abuse. So getting to our young people early, making sure that they have the resources they need to deal with mental health is really important to me. I deal a lot with at-risk kids through Big Brothers Big Sisters mm -hmm. and other agencies, and so that's my main oh. concern. Yeah. Thank you, Minority Vice Chair. Rep Hoodley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Frankly, I wish we didn't mm. need this committee, mm. but unfortunately, it's a, a, a growing issue in the mm -hmm. state of Michigan. And uh, I will say that I'm honored to be on this committee, uh, surrounded by people with the qualifications and, frankly, a whole panel of people that are going to take this issue serious. Uh, as Vice Chair uh, Smoltz said, I think we've all had people in our family, friends that have, have suffered with mental illness, suicides, depression, anxiety. And uh, I'm looking forward to digging into these issues and seeing what we can all do uh, together bipartisanly to uh, yeah. handle, handle this. Thank you very much. I am honored to be here. Thank you, Rep. Rep St. Germain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hmm. Over the years, I've just seen far too many people uh, close to me take their life. Mm. Um, so I concur with my colleagues. Thank you for having me here. Um, for me, I want mental health to be recognized as a sickness and as a disability. Um, I provide disability programs here in Michigan and they don't always cover uh, mental health as a sickness. Uh, we need to change that, thank you. Thank you, Rep. Rep Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, um, my background is in nursing. I am a nurse. I have practiced both in a hospital setting, long-term acute care, a nursing home, skilled nursing facilities. So I have a pretty wide range of experience. I know very clearly how mental health affects every member of the healthcare team, mm -hmm. uh, the families of people that come in that have been diagnosed or possibly misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, or not diagnosed. And I live in the Down River community, so I represent Wayne County. Um, I see absolutely a very limited access to mental health services in our community Down River. Mm -hmm. I also am a grandmother and a mother, mm -hmm. and I'm very concerned about how mental health is affecting our children. I agree with our minority vice chair Kathy Schmaltz uh, regarding what is going on on social media with our young girls. Um, we have a, a severe crisis on our hands that I think we need to address. We need to address in the legislature, within our communities. And I am very excited that I have a lot of background in this that I can bring to the table. And I'm, I'm ready to get to work and actually come up with some solutions for our families. So I thank you. Thank you, Rep. I appreciate it. Well, thank you all for sharing that. It's really important, I think, not only for me, but for all of us to kind of know how we come at this work that we get to do together. Uh, so I'm grateful to all of you for sharing. Uh, you know, for me, th this work uh, is um, both personal and professional. Uh, you know, Rep Thompson was just talking about being a mom and a grandma. Uh, you know, I'm a mom uh, and, uh, you know, sister and daughter. Uh, and, you know, being able to, to help people is uh, why I got into the work that I get to do. Uh, and so professionally, I know Rep uh, Ryan can mention this, but uh, I do come at this work professionally uh, with a master's in clinical social work and then a doctorate in clinical psychology. Uh, and I feel so honored and lucky to be able to do that work. I mean, I feel like there's no better job than being a therapist. Uh, and I've done it for um, almost the past 30 years, uh, which is crazy to say because it makes me feel old. But um, I am grateful, and I, when I get to sit with people uh, and walk with them on their journey, like I said, there's nothing greater uh, than to be able to do that. Uh, and then working in the public sphere, I've had the honor as a, a county commissioner of then working um, with one of our presenters today uh, in the public system. 
you know, so I got to know the public system very well uh, as well and uh, got to see some of the things that were happening there and then how the systems, the public and the private systems interact um, or don't interact as the case may be. Uh, and so, you know, I'm hoping to be able to work with all of you with those, kind of from those perspectives, both personal and professional. Uh, and uh, back in the 2001, uh, I got to lead for our caucus a, a mental health care listening tour throughout the state. Uh, the two big things that came out of that and that I hear over and over again, both from clients and consumers and uh, from practitioners, um, are access, which many of you spoke about today. The other major thing that I want us to work on is workforce. We don't have enough mental health care workers to be able to provide that access that we so desperately need for folks. Uh, and so as we're working, those are the two main things that I'm going to continue to think about for us you know, as we're, we're coming up with the ideas to be able to do all the things that we want to be able to do to help Michiganders here. Uh, and so work force uh, and, and getting folks here, not only recruiting but retaining those mental health care workers here so that people have the access to the care that they need so that, as Representative Pahutsky said, no one slips through the cracks. Or as uh, I think, I believe it was uh, Representative uh, St. Germain talked about, there are too many people who completed suicide. Uh, we just have too many people that we need to be able to help. And, uh, and I think the work that we'll be able to do here will have a great impact. So I'm excited to be able to do that all uh, as a team with all of you. Uh, and one of the ways that I wanted to get started was being able to kind of lay the foundation for what, what is out there, you know, what, what's happening, particularly in our public system, so that folks know, where, and we all come with the same information. I think when we have the same information, it allows us to problem solve, um, at, least, at least at a, a base level, it allows us to problem solve together in a different way. Uh, and so I'm very excited that we have our presenters here today. Uh, and so first up, uh, we are going to have Alan Bolter. Uh, and Alan is the Associate Director of the Community Mental Health Association of Michigan. Uh, and Alan and I have gotten to work together for years, um, and I'm grateful for his expertise uh, and the work that he has done for our state. Um, it just has been invaluable. And so there's, I always learn something from Alan, always, um, because there's so much to know about the public system. <laughs> uh, and so I'm grateful that you're here. Thank you, Alan. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Really appreciate the the opportunity and, and, and the forum to um, you know, you know, again, you know, lay the, the foundation of, of what Michigan's public mental health system is. Um, as Representative Brabeck said, my name is Alan Bolter. I'm the Associate Director of the CMH Association of Michigan. We represent uh, essentially Michigan's public mental health system, which includes the 46 community mental health agencies across the state, the 10 prepaid inpatient health plans, and over 100 providers that provide uh, services for our CMH and PIHP system. Our members serve you know, a little over 300,000 uh, Michiganders across the state with serious mental illness, intellectual developmental disabilities, kids with serious emotional disturbances, and substance use disorders. Um, and, and before I get into the slides, uh, you know, Representative Brabeck is, is exactly right. You know, I would categorize the, the three areas of concern that my guess is 90% of the people that would contact your office regarding mental health would be in three areas, access to care, workforce, inpatient needs. I mean, th those are the, the absolute critical um, areas out there. So I, I'm going to work through the, uh, the PowerPoint here, It'll take five, six, seven minutes or so. I'm really going to give you kind of a 10,000 foot perspective of what Michigan's public mental health system looks like, who they serve, what they do, and then we'll turn it over to Lisa Williams and Trish Cortez to go through a little bit more in depth on our CCBHC Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic um, initiative that's going on across the state. So already, already mentioned, um, our 
CMHA, what we do, who we represent. Um, you know, so I want to start. The Michigan's mental health services are really embedded in the Michigan Constitution. Article 8, Section 8 of the Constitution really lays out the state's uh, responsibility to provide and support mental health services for those uh, across the state of Michigan. Um, and, and what's interesting, over the last number of years, this slide kind of goes through that transfer of authority. So we have in the Constitution the state's role and responsibility. Then through the years, the state has given that role and responsibility, has passed that on uh, to um, local units of government, to our counties. So our CMH, community mental health agencies, PIHPs, prepaid inpatient health plans, um, our, our county-based entities. Um, all 46 CMHs are either a county department or a, a, an authority uh, uh, of a county. Um, our 10 PIHPs are made up of our CMH system. So three of those 10 PIHPs are one and the same. They are both a CMH and a PIHP. They're the three largest counties in the state, Wayne, Oakland, and Macomb. They serve both functions as a managing entity and a, a CMH role. The other seven PIHPs are made up of the regional entities where they have multiple CMHs within their region um, that they are made up of. And I have a, a map that goes through those uh, in a couple of slides. Evolution of the CMH system here in Michigan, really back in the 60s through President um, Kennedy really established the Community Mental Health Act where it was really a movement where you know, in the 50s and 60s and before then, most individuals suffering from mental illness were essentially housed in hospitals. And this just kind of shows the, the evolution from a hospital-based system to a community-based system that we have now. Um, again, our... Um, our, our PIHP system, so our, our prepaid inpatient health plans, are the behavioral health managed care entities uh, for Medicaid here in, in Michigan. Michigan has actually been a, a managed care state for behavioral health services since the late 90s, um, something that we were very much ahead of the curve of, of other states going to managed care in, in this space far before other states. Our PIHPs provide uh, financial and managed care functions for persons enrolled in Medicaid, My Child, Healthy Michigan, Autism Services, and Substance Use Disorder Services. Our Community Mental Health Service Programs, or our CMHs, have a wide array of, of services and programs that they oversee and responsible for at the local level. This kind of gives you a little bit more in depth of um, you know what what are some of the things that they do locally. Um, would would like to point out that um, you know everything that our our CMH system is responsible for all all the programs all the services really there have two really main. Uh, primary areas that they're responsible for, um, which was laid out in the mental health code. So one would be covering individuals on Medicaid, um, and essentially Medicaid makes up probably 95% of the funding for our, our public mental health system, but they are not responsible for all individuals on, on Medicaid. So right now, I think Michigan's Medicaid program has roughly 3 million people um, on it. Our CMH system, PHP system, are responsible for roughly 300,000 to 350,000 people. So they are responsible for those individuals with really the, the highest level of need. So individuals with serious mental illness, people with intellectual developmental disabilities, kids with serious emotional disturbances, and then individuals with uh, substance use disorders. The other... Um, area that they are essentially responsible for would be what I like to describe as the local safety net or, or crisis-based services. So when there is an issue locally or you have an individual locally who is in crisis, regardless if they're on Medicaid, 
have no insurance, commercial insurance, um, you know, the CMH is responsible for those crisis-based services. And then I have a couple of slides coming up that will um, outline essentially what, what that looks like. Um, again, here, this is a, a map of, of what our CMH system looks like, where they are uh, across the state, our, our 10 PIHP regions uh, across the state. Um, and I think it's, it's important to, um, to point out that Michigan's CMH public mental health system really was not designed, and it's certainly not funded, to be a place where all mental health needs um, go for, for, for the entire state. I mean, it was intended to be limited to those most in need. So, you know, typically the stat that's thrown out that probably one out of five individuals are, are suffering some from some form of, of mental illness. So if you do the math in the state of Michigan, if we have roughly 10 million people, you're talking about 2 million people across the state of Michigan alone Again, our, our public mental health system is responsible for a small portion of that, and I think it was intended to be that through state statute and, and things of, of that nature. Um, it's also important, I think, to point out that our system as a um, local unit of government, kind of born on a county government, really has connections to the local communities. And I know something that, that Lisa and Trish will really highlight as they talk about CCBHCs, but I think you know the next couple of, of slides do a nice job kind of showing how our CMH system really connects with so many other aspects in, in your local communities, um, where it is really um, in, embedded in your local communities. So you know this particular slide shows how your local CMH you know, partners with schools, with law enforcement, with the housing community, food assistance, things, things of that nature, the care that is provided through the public mental health system looks very different than traditional health care. You know, it, it, isn't, it doesn't look like traditional, like you go to the doctor if you're sick and then, you know, you're, you're, you're in and you're out. It looks very much like a social or, or community-based care. Um, I think a lot of folks, when they think about mental health care, um, it is talk therapy, sitting on a couch or a chair talking to a therapist and it is it is far different from that and again i think um you know the, the slides that that trish and lisa will go through regarding ccbhc's really highlight what we're kind of talking about kind of give you a picture of um of what that community-based care looks like again this this slide just kind of you know shows if you kind of think of it as a bell curve really who who um, our, our, our CMH system is, is responsible for. Um, Michigan is very unique, as you can imagine, regarding its public mental health system. We are one of the only states in the nation that provides services for, for the four main populations I, I described previously. Adults with serious mental illness, kids with serious emotional disturbances, individuals with intellectual developmental disabilities, and then individuals with substance use disorder, in a managed care setting. A lot of times you see a lot of states have these different populations kind of piecemealed out. Some of them are covered under the state. Some are covered by providers in the community. But in Michigan, we kind of have them housed under, under our, our public mental health system, again, which is, is very unique. Um, and some of these slides, I'm not going to go through all the detail. Again, it kind of goes through who, who our members serve, um, you know, and what, you know, what order they are required to serve them. This slide kind of gives you a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of all those four populations I described. What are the different percentages? So how, how many individuals with, with mental illness um, are, are served? And then really how, how the money is divided up amongst these different populations. So it kind of gives you a, a different snapshot where you know the bulk of the money is actually spent on individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities when they only represent maybe 45 to 50,000 people across the state. Um, and then you know, there are far more individuals with, with mental illness and they, they require less, less funding. So the last things I, I just wanted to mention, the last couple of slides really talk about um, two models that, that we are you know, very excited about, that our membership is very excited about, and we believe really kind of describe the future of, of where are we headed as a public mental health system, where is the future of, of mental health care heading. Um, both of these, I think, are excellent examples of 
on the ground, person-centered care, um, really integrated care between physical and health care, but taking place on the ground. So the first one, I'm just going to briefly mention the CCBHC. Again, we have lots of acronyms, Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Um, and again, Lisa and Trish will, will really get into, into detail of, of what they are doing running these programs at, at the local level. Um, so I'll, I'll let them go into that. But I would like to point out um, one aspect on CCBHC, which I think could be a, a game changer moving forward. Um, in order to be a certified behavioral health clinic, it it eliminates the the mandate, um, and, and I like to describe this this approach of being a certified behavioral health clinic as, as really a no wrong door approach. So, you know, I described earlier, you know, really the, the limited scope of our CMH system is, you know, those individuals on Medicaid and that crisis service, CCBHC kind of throws that out the window and they are required and mandated to serve anyone that shows up at their door, regardless if you have commercial insurance, you have no insurance, you're on Medicaid. So it really, it, it provides a no wrong door approach at, at the local level. And again, they will go into far more detail on that. The other model I, I wanted to, to mention in, um, I think you know we're very excited about, and I have some some detailed info uh, on these. Would be our, our health home models. So we have behavioral health homes and opioid health homes uh, across the state of Michigan. They've been in place for a number of years now, as you see here on uh, on this slide. And really, the the health homes have provided some some great outcomes across the state. Um, really, we've seen care improvement and care coordination from their participants locally. Um, the majority of our health homes are really located in our northern Michigan region. So um, kind of the, the, the tip of the mitt, as I like to describe it, north and then the upper peninsula. Um, but they have seen um, in this health home and opioid health home model, cost of overall health care decrease for their participants, increased follow-up visits, uh, decreased lengths of stay in hospitals, decreased readmissions, and better overall physical health care for the people that participated. Um, you know, I, I mentioned you know, where the majority of them are, are located. Really, both of these models, um, the behavioral health home and opioid health homes, are um, coordinated care models um, for the participants at, at the local level. And as this committee has future meetings, um, would certainly encourage this committee to, to take a look at that, to invite some of the health home sites in, um, listen to what, what they have done, what some of their successes have been locally. Um, and and I, I think, you know, it, it's been pointed out a couple of times through some of your priorities. I think it's important to realize um, that, you know, Michigan is very diverse. You know, we have very different communities across the state and, and, and sometimes, um, you know, different approaches would be necessary in, in providing care. So with that, I will um, turn it over to Lisa Williams, who is the CEO of West Michigan CMH, which is um, Lake Oceana and Mason counties, and Trish Cortez, who's the CEO of, of Washtenaw CMH, which is from the Washtenaw County area. So let me get out of this and I will pull up their slides. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. Uh, Representative Braybeck, thank you for the invitation. Um, uh, so you can see here on the first slide, my credentials that I am a nurse. Uh, that being said, I feel like I have to tell everyone that's been a long, long, long time since I've actually done any nursing work. So if anybody's gonna have a medical emergency, we're gonna turn our attention to Representative Thompson over here because she can attend to that better than I. So um, yeah, so I've been, I'm the, um, the CEO in Washtenaw County, and I've been part of the mental health system for, I've been working there for 23 years. Um, it's near and dear to my heart, and I can't tell you, and I'm sure my colleagues will share the sentiment to hear that, number one, this, this committee exists, that I feel like we've been kind of like lost in you know larger issues and never had a focus on what we're doing. I 100% agree, and we'll talk about it, is more important now than ever. Um, and I'm just delighted to hear that there is a whole panel of, of individuals that really want to focus on this. So I want to thank you for your service. And with that, I'm going to grab my phone so we can keep an eye on the time. Hi there. And also, thank you for having us, Representative Brayback. 
Um, we are thrilled to be here and thrilled to talk to you about something we are incredibly passionate about um, because of the way it has transformed uh, the, the communities that we serve and our abilities to serve them in unique ways. Um, listening to the concerns and the issues that brought you all to serve on this committee um, is really exciting to me because it's the they're the issues and the concerns that we face and we try to address in our communities on a daily basis. So we're very eager to um, share with you CCBHC as a system of care and a model for addressing a lot of those concerns. Um, I'm a psychologist by training. Um, I also have not practiced in a long time, so kudos to Representative Bradock for <laughs> both both practicing and continuing to. Um, now I'd spend much more time working on um, policy in our local community mental health and um, hopefully creating opportunities for our well-trained staff to provide services to folks. So uh, I've been with West Michigan CMH for 23 years also. Um, Trish and I learned last night that we entered the system at almost the same time So and um, have been CEOs also about the same amount of time. So um, we're eager to talk to you about Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic and um, how it is transforming our system. So. So as Lisa mentioned, um, you know, CCBHCs uh, have really, really transformed um, what we were doing. A little uh, uh, story about Washtenaw County. Um, prior to um, the state of Michigan becoming an official demonstration state, um, the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners voted to put on the ballot a millage for a, a combined public safety mental health millage. To be with very little work, um, it actually passed two to one. And it was, it's really amazing, um, you know, what, what, what that has helped us do in our community. But one of the things that we did once the millage passed is that we did a focus groups across all of Washtenaw County and asked the voters, so now that this has passed, what do you want? And what is unbelievable to me is that what they described as a CCBHC. They wanted access to services for all, agnostic of insurance, and a broader array of service. And so that's what, um, you know, what I think is just fascinating about the work that we're doing is that it's exactly what the voters in, in Washington County told us what they wanted us to do. I think one of the other critical elements is that, and we'll talk about this in a, in a couple of slides, is that the breadth of what a CCBHC can offer um, is much more than what folks have traditionally thought about as, as mental health services. And the questions that Alan mentioned at the beginning that you're most likely to hear around access, workforce, and demand for inpatient are largely addressed through the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. And it's done in a way that addresses the local community needs. So it's not a one size fits all. It's really what are the resources and, and tools available in your community and how do you interface those resources and tools with what the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic can provide. So they think that's one of the really exciting things. There's a core set of services, but it's built around the community and the community needs, which makes it a very a nice extension of a community mental health center. Um, you know, this, this slide just goes through more, um, but what I really wanna touch on is, and we'll talk about a little bit more, is the whole safety net. Um, I think that what gets lost upon, and you know, as, as I'm sure many of you know, there's been an ongoing debate for at least almost a decade about transforming the system, and 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 you know, and I'm sure you all have heard uh, a lot about that. But one of the things I think is so important for individuals to understand is this whole safety net component. Really, we we, we the work that we do goes far beyond billing codes. As a matter of fact, a lot of what we do has no billing code. And that is the whole safety net part. That is what we do with law enforcement. We don't bill any of that. What we do in our schools, we don't bill any of that. What we do in our, our housing homeless community, we don't bill any of that either. Yeah, we do treatment. We provide, we do medicines and nursing and injections and therapy. We do all of that and we bill for all of that. But really, it's all the work that we do with all those other sectors that we don't bill for that is absolutely critical to the health of our communities. And so that, and the, and the difficulty has been that, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this, is that yes, we are a crisis provider, but then after that, if you don't have Medicaid, and if you don't qualify for a mental health system, 
where do you go? And that is the big problem. The problem is, is that then if you don't have the right insurance and the right acuity, then you sit on a wait list. And so that is what we're going to talk about more today is that that's what this resolves. So I think the other really uh, exciting component of certified community behavioral health clinics and the interface with the public system really is something that Rep Representative Glanville brought up, which is that notion of whole person care, meeting the needs of the person, as Senator Stabenow would say, above and below the neck. Um, recognizing that we are whole people, that our physical health conditions affect our mental health conditions, and that our mental health conditions and the treatment for mental illness can sometimes affect our physical health in pretty, pretty significant, uh, profound ways over the course of time. So certified community behavioral health clinics, part of their foundation is around ensuring that whole person care. Part of it's through interface with primary care and that safety net, but part of it is also through addressing people's needs in person-centered plans that reflect both their physical and their mental health care needs. Yeah, sure. So the first, this slide, we, we're going to... We're going to talk not so much right off our slides in case you can't tell, um, <laughs> but uh, we did want to include some really core information for you about what a CCBHC is. There is a lot more information available. Alan, Trish, and I can happily provide any of that to the committee um, so that you have some resource materials for more comprehensive understanding. But a CCBHC is really a federal definition of what it means to be a CMH. Senator Stabenow, who proposed the legislation around certified community behavioral health clinics, is from Michigan. She knew what the Michigan system provided and what it provided above and beyond what many other state mental health systems have to offer. Part of that is foundationally from the public nature of who we are and that, that county-based connection that ensures our, our commitment to the safety net in those local communities. So a consistent availability of a set of standard practices that we'll talk about in a minute. And no matter where you live, no matter what your insurance, the services of that CCBHC are available to you in the communities where CCBHCs exist. But if you happen to be from the other side of the state and you're in Ludington on vacation and you have a mental health emergency, the CCBHC in Mason County will address your needs. So that transportability that across the across the across the state access is part of what a CCBHC guarantees and I think it's important uh, the example of you know wherever you are and when you're in that emergency I know that um, I'm sure that many of you at some point got calls with somebody frustrated who's sitting in an emergency room and we share frustration because I'm frustrated when I hear of why aren't you taking care of this person while well, they have commercial insurance mm -hmm. We're not funded to do that. And so again, the, you know, we share these frustrations and, and, the, and, the, and you know, there's a human being in the middle, which is really unfortunate. And so this is a way to solve that problem. It doesn't matter anymore what insurance, what acuity, we can, we can offer you know, that help that, in, that individual needs. Alan mentioned um, that traditional services, most of us think about therapy, most of us think about medication, most of us think about um, those kinds of things, that traditional couch therapy. Um, mental health services through the public mental health system have always been more than those services, but CCBHC expands those services to these nine core services that every CCBHC must provide. So including a whole set of services that were previously, previously not reimbursable under Medicaid and are not reimbursable under most insurances. CCBHCs still provide them. Um, so in the state of Michigan, if you, if you happen to land in the mental health system and you happen to be in a community where the CCBHC exists and you have private insurance, you can get a high quality benefit regardless of whether that, that service is reimbursable through, reimbursable through an insurance company. Incredibly important. Um, and quite frankly, it's in the services beyond what we traditionally think about where real recovery happens, mm -hmm. where real recovery is sustained, where recidivism <coughs> rates are reduced, 
where the need for inpatient care is no longer required. These core services are not going to go through them, um, but what I do want to point out is the crisis mobile um, team in Washtenaw County has been absolutely um, in, in, invaluable, and I'll talk a little bit more, more about that. And it's not just about the emergency room visit, it's about the contact with law enforcement. It's sitting in front of a judge. It's the homelessness. Um, and so it's, it's, it goes far beyond what we think about, you know, medical care or health care. It goes go into social services, and we, we address those crises as well. Targeted case management is, I think, sorely needed. Just about everybody needs help filling out the multiple forms and applications and, um, that, are, that are required. Um, and the peer supports um, is, is also someone who actually can walk alongside you with li lived experience is a way to help engage not everybody, I think one of the notions that, every, that, that sometimes I get frustrated with is that just because someone um, has a mental illness does not mean that they necessarily want treatment. They may at some point in time have no, no insight into their, uh, their, into their mental illness, nor I mean, we haven't completely busted through the stigma. So having a peer or someone that could actually walk alongside you is one of the most effective ways to get individuals into services. And we could tell stories about, you know, we have a specialized homeless team, and it might take months to years to actually get an individual, to actually trust someone, to actually get them a house or out of a tent, and eventually getting all those needs met before we could actually get them to come see with us uh, and, and, and see a psychiatrist or a prescriber to get some medicines. So that engagement piece always gets under, you know, we talk a lot about engagement in the SUD world, but for mental illness, it is just as critical in many, many cases. So just because someone, if, you, if I, I have hypertension, so I take hypertensive uh, uh, medications, um, but that's not always translates the same in, in the mental health field. And so having these array of services helps get that engagement into our services and into a broader array of services that's, that, as we've mentioned over and over, is far beyond what traditional insurances even cover. So one of the things that um, Alan had a really fabulous slide where he had kind of the basket weave laid out um, f about that safety net notion. And certified community behavioral health clinics expand the ability of the CMHs to do that through their, their requirements and their support and their payment around things like convening people together. And they don't mandate how you convene. They don't say you must convene these groups of people. They say you must coordinate care across all of these groups of people and all of these service providers that might exist in your community. But they actually allow the community to define how that safety net weaves together. It's a super critical point of what makes a CCBHC effective in the community where it sits. Trish and I in a little bit will talk about some data from our communities our data looks pretty different, not because we're not both doing all of these kinds of services, because we are, but the needs in my three counties are a little bit different than the needs in Washtenaw where different kinds of services exist, or in my community where certain kinds of services were already provided, but other things didn't happen. So that's one of the really critical components that we'll continue to talk about. Um, it's again, it's the safety net is the services beyond those CBT codes and the ability of the CCBHC to be a convener because of that safety net space that it occupies is critical to, critical to its success. You, as, as a convener on, in, in full transparency, prior to um, CCBHC, yes, we're part of the safety net and so I'd get asked to come to all these places, you know, with schools. Mm -hmm. And it was always, uh, you know, always a little bit hesitant because I know that they were saying, well, can you help? And again, we were restrained by who we can serve, what's your insurance, what's your acuity. And so it was really kind of uncomfortable as how much can I really help? Now I can really truly feel, and even as a, as a CEO, I've really 
changed because I'm no longer almost kind of hesitant, fearful. So now we, I meet regularly with all the superintendents in Washtenaw County, and I'm so pleased to hear there's many of you that that is your focus because that is a real crisis that we are facing um, right now. We, do, we meet with all of our chiefs of police. We meet with all of our housing providers, and we are finally there not – being afraid of being like we're not going to be able to deliver what you're asking us to do because now we can and so now we can be a true convener in, in our communities. We just put in one quick slide to um, let you know that there are there are multiple types of CCBHCs in Michigan. Um, a handful of us are there are 13 of us in the state that are demonstration sites, um, which means that. Um, the state has participated in a particular demonstration program with the federal government, and it's a different kind of a payment model. Um, the great majority of the CCBHCs in Michigan right now are grant funded through SAMHSA, um, Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration at the federal government, um, through one of two types of grants, uh, one of which are called expansion grants, and the other are innovation and advancement grants, which are really for those CCBHCs that have existed for a long period of time. Both um, Washtenaw and West Michigan CMH came in early on expansion grants in 2018, and both of us became demonstration sites at the beginning of last year um, in October of 2022. Nope, 2021, sorry. So um, I just want to make sure we can provide a lot more information in detail about what differentiates. The core services are the same. It's really the method of payment that differs um, as um, through those two kinds of grants. And the, I think the only thing to also mention about the, the, uh, the grant-funded CCBHCs is to know is that there are other CMHs that are ready to go. Ready. So if, if, if we can expand to uh, actually be sites and official certified sites, there are many uh, CMH is out there that because of these grants are are locked and loaded ready to ready to flip the switch and be a CCBHC so the next slide is probably where we're going to spend the majority of our time talking and providing you with some real-life examples of how CCBHC is is living and breathing in our communities um, the enhanced coordination of care means that there is less duplication of services uh, lots of warm transfers between service providers in our communities that provide all kinds of critical functions um, and then also improved outcomes because of that coordination of care. Um, the number one thing, we'll kind of start in the top there, is that uh, huge improvements in access to people as a result of, particip of uh, the, the implementation of CCBHCs in our communities particularly individuals in the mild to moderate community who largely went unserved by the public mental health system um, and did not have adequate access, particularly in rural communities, um, to private providers who, who could meet that mild to moderate need. Um, the other really critical component related to access, we've mentioned it several times, we'll probably mention it several more, is that we are now available to serve individuals with private insurance. And we, we do bill. Uh, for our services to private insurance for those things that um, the insurance company will pay for. So it's super, um, but we also provide the other services regardless of that, um, that payment mechanism. So, um, which basically means that more and more people are getting access to our services. We're breaking down barriers to access, barriers to stigma, um, telehealth, uh, audio health, uh, quick visits, uh, meeting people in the community where they're at, um, mobile crisis teams that don't require ER visits for, for crisis, um, traveling along in um, police cars, all sorts of things like that that create new venues for access for people that um, are in our communities with real mental health needs and regardless of their type of insurance. So huge component of the access. The crisis services, um, so we do 24-7, 365 day uh, crisis services. In Washington County, being a larger county, we actually position those clinicians strategically so they can make it to all the way from the east side to the west side in, uh, in 30 minutes or less. The calls that we kind of, that we get can be everything from obviously law enforcement, we'll talk a lot about that, from our emergency rooms, it is from neighborhoods, our, our shopping malls, our downtowns, et cetera. 
Um, it has really been, um, and, and what's great about the CCPHC is that we've had, and I'll talk a little bit more later, is you know, we've had crisis services, but it's been limited to just resolving that exact crisis. And then after that, depending on what's happening, what can we do next? Now we've been, and it was a, a team, our original team prior to CCBHC were uh, mostly all master's level social workers. Our, our crisis team now has been able to expand to include peers, to do, have um, you know, real time psychiatry, next day appointments, et cetera. So we've really been able to broaden the disciplines on our crisis team. Last night when uh, Lisa and I were having dinner, got a message on my phone and it was that there was a crisis negotiation uh, SWAT team call. In Washington County, um, we have trained our, a lot of our crisis folks with the FBI training and they are actually part of the crisis negotiation team um, on our SWAT team in Washington County and they have been super valuable as they are able to be in real time looking electronic medical record. Do we know them? No, but who knows them? Oh, they got a grandmother. Call the grandmother. The grandmother's got a good relationship with them. And we are able to provide a wealth of knowledge in a very intense situation right alongside our law enforcement partners. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's, it's the, the, the opportunities and the possibilities are endless. And continuing around that crisis continuum, we have three counties. So we're geog from a geographical perspective, we're huge, right? So from one end of the county to the other end of the farthest county is an hour and 45 minutes. So we have multiple mobile crisis teams. And similar to Trish, those teams are comprised of they have therapists, they have access to a psychiatrist, they have care managers, they have peers. And they're able to identify and meet the need of the person where they are in their community um, in their home if they choose um, or in another in the school setting or wherever the wherever the crisis has arisen and really kind of create a, a, a connection that then builds to earlier to ongoing services on the substance use disorder side we're working with local EMS to create um, pathways for folks where there are Narcan rescues so that the very next morning there's a referral for substance abuse treatment sitting on our desk and a contact from a peer happens first thing that day. Um, again, that notion of being able to engage people in the moments in their mental health crisis where they're most in need and most likely to respond to support for services, not letting them sit and wait a couple of days to gain access. So really, really critical um, crisis intervention. Um, the other huge pathway um, that's created through the safety net um, in the CCBHC is through enhanced relationships with primary care. But not just enhanced relationships with primary care, but within our own organizations, the ability to do early identification and screening of unmet primary care needs and to create appropriate referrals, again, through that coordination of care for those folks. One of my um, both most frustrating and most most sort of rewarding stories related to when we began our primary care screening process is a woman who kept coming to our office complaining of shoulder pain. Um, she had a mental health condition. We were, we were working with her um, to treat her depression and her anxiety. Um, but this, this chronic shoulder pain kept bringing her to the ER in the middle of the night. She was in so much pain. She kept getting discharged because they assumed she was drug seeding because she had a mental health condition and they were basically refusing to, to treat her. So she'd gone for all that time. Um, we, did a, we did a screening on her. We brought her in, did a screening on her, did an actual, had a nurse do an exam, looked at her and said, oh my gosh, her arm is broken. Sent her over, got an x-ray woman had been struggling with a broken arm for four and a half months that had been undiagnosed because she had a mental health condition and was in the ER and was presumed to be drug seeking. That's not, that's not okay. <laughs> um, and that's not, um, that's not putting together the whole person, right? That's not recognizing that just because you have a mental health condition doesn't mean that these other things that are happening in your life aren't still significant. So that coordination with primary care, that identification of primary care folks who are really willing to work with our consumers, those partnerships with our federally qualified health centers, all of those things are the way that we start to connect, we start to build. I mean, there's no reason somebody should suffer with something as treatable as a broken arm for four months. <laughs> no reason. 
We had a partnership with our FQHC uh, Packard Clinic in Washington County for since 2004. Um, you know, my predecessors started talking about uh, integrated care way before it became the buzzword that it is today. Um, and that, re that relationship flourished mostly with our FQHC. To this day, my medical director still spends a half a day a week um, in our FQHC. But what has really transformed over time, and we've done, we do that kind of integration. We, you know, originally back in 2004, we had this vision and notion that we were going to make a virtual CMH that lived in, in primary care. Well, despite our best efforts to make that happen, everybody, you know, our, uh, the people we serve voted with their feet and they just wouldn't go. So then we try to reverse that integration into the community mental health system because one of the facts that we know is that the individuals with severe mental illness died 25 years before um, the general population. And that was kind of our quest was to change, uh, you know, uh, bend that curve. And we were doing that in partnership with our FQHC. Today, after many evolutions of what that looks like, what's really great is that um, through the support of CMH in the FQHC, we've really been able to uh, broaden the depth and breadth of what primary care providers are willing to do in, in, in the space of mental health. And so what that means is that all of this conversation, as you're listening to us saying you know, that, oh, we can take care, take care of everyone, well, we can't hold on to everyone forever either. Mm -hmm. We need our community partners. This takes a village to, to, to uh, address these issues. And, but what's been fantastic in our relationship with Packard Clinic that we are working to replicate with um, kind of our, our adolescent kids version of uh, corner health in our clinic is, that, is to really, um, and other clinics, is to really develop kind of what I call smooth on-ramps and off-ramps. So as, you know, uh, mental illness, sometimes, you know, it, it, it's not always just steady and stable. And, but there's times when a primary care physician needs specialty care. So there's a point in time when I might have to go see a cardiologist and not just my, my primary care physician, right? But so that is the t that's the type of, of relationship that we have um, solved with our, you know, with our partnerships and also addressing primary care is that, you know, we, there, well, there's times when they need to come to us, but if they stabilize, there's times when they can continue to see their primary care physician. So there's real opportunity in who we can uh, serve and the, and, the partner, and, and, and the partnerships are still vital. Um, law enforcement, so I've talked a lot about law enforcement. Um, we do a lot of that in, um, in Washington County. We're doing a, an exciting pilot now um, that we can, will be a whole other topic. Um, but again, as part of that safety net, um, you know, in Washington County, we are the provider in the county jail. We are the provider in, uh, in many of these special, specialty courts. Um, what's been really interesting for me in thinking about the possibilities in the future is that um, you know, we've, we've been the, in, in Judge Valvo's uh, mental health court for a number of years. Um, Judge Burke's sobriety court, you know, Judge Kunke's um, circuit court around mental health issues. Um, and what's been hard over, it's, it's all about, for, for the courts, it's all about funding. So they have to you know, apply for a grant. And you know, depending on how much they get, obviously the bulk of, um, of what that grant is has to come to us because we are providing services to whoever is before them. Again, the issue is around all of that, you know, do you have Medicaid, do you not have Medicaid? And so we rely, or the judges rely on, the, on that grant funding. It's interesting now is because I sit not here and think, well, Judge Valvo, I, I mean, you probably need to apply for funding to have your specialty docket and, you know, do that kind of an administrative piece of it. But really, all of your people are my people now. And I, you don't really need all that grant money. And it really has me thinking about a different way of funding a lot of different things that we're doing that we rely on these piecemeal grants from whether it's in the housing world or if it's in the... Uh, judicial world, et cetera. So, because now they're all kind of our people. Um, so, it's an interesting thing to to think about, and something that I'm sure that all of you will um, be thinking about here in the future. One of the um, other opportunities that comes with being a CCBHC and being part of that convening safety net uh, member in your community. Um, comes the opportunity for these additional types of grants and additional types of connections. Um, West Michigan CMH had previously had a Department of Justice grant. 
that we worked on with the uh, law enforcement and judges across our three counties. Um, and through um, that grant, began to do things like uh, CIT training with our local jails um, and with our local law enforcement folks out on the streets, our sheriff's departments, all of those kinds of things. Um, but those opportunities begin to build, right? So now, in addition to the DOJ grant and the CIT training and diversion activities, we're also doing substance abuse treatment in the jails. We're doing, um, we're preparing to do medication assisted treatment in the jails in all three counties, launching people back into the community, transitioning them out of those kinds of environments right into healthy treatment. Uh, healthy treatment options. I, I love Trisha's analogy of on-ramps and off-ramps. That's going to happen throughout our community. We want to make it easy for folks to make those connections and some of those convening activities through that safety net again start to create the fabric for those ramps. Schools, again, really happy to hear about that. You know, with schools, um, you know, as, as the association gathers all of us um, uh, I mean, multiple times a year, um, you know, I guess the, 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 the sad thing is, is um, that, you know, when I'm, when I'm with all my colleagues and I, we start talking about the acuity and what we're seeing in our youths and our communities, I find some solace in that I feel like I'm not alone. But the, what's really sad is that I'm not alone. <laughs> and this is something that is, that is statewide. Um, so for, you know, my board um, has really um, directed me as this is one of our top priorities is to bring the community together, what is a comprehensive system of care, and our top priority is now youth and how we, you know, we create that. One of the things, um, you know, that, that I think a lot of communities are struggling with is that, you know, what we've learned is that when kids are having a crisis at, while at school, the school social workers, the bar where they think that, that a child may need hospitalization is set about here. Because we do the pre-screening pre functions in the emergency rooms and give the thumbs up, thumbs down of who gets authorized for an inpatient bed, the bar is up here. And so all these kids are being, you know, from their very, very um, caring social workers being sent, and the social workers are terrified, quite frankly, and then they're sitting in emergency rooms. They're never going to get admitted. It's, the emergency room can be a traumatizing place in and of itself. So one of the things that our crisis team has been able to do is after partnering with University of Michigan, uh, Michigan Medicine Emergency Room, we actually um, trained all the social workers on the Columbia. So apply the Columbia, and if it doesn't get, hit this level of score, call the crisis team. Don't send an emergency room. We'll go out there. We'll do safety planning. So there's a lot, to, a lot of work to be done in the schools, and um, again, this is a way for us to be able to address those needs. In our community, one of the things that we began doing was working and training our local, um, as part of a, a pre-existing uh, collaborative uh, commitment between us, United Way, local DHS, um, and a variety of other organizations, was really to create a, a different set of connections for kids in the school so they could have pathways they could see a therapist in the school, but they didn't necessarily have to enroll in CMH. But if they needed to enroll in CMH, they could move into CMH. So as part of that work, we did a significant amount of training with those clinicians and our clinicians around early identification and assessment of substance use for kids in the school settings, um, uh, suicide screening for kids in settings, and also zero suicide implementation. Um, particularly in, in um, the school-based environment. So, Alan just passed me a note to pick up the pace, so we're going to pick up the pace on uh, these next few slides. The next one is pretty self-explanatory. You can just see that the number of individuals that we serve has um, risen quite dramatically in both of our counties. I think the take home on this one is, as uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, that CCBHC may, it's the, it's the same, but it might impact your community differently. In my community, we um, did not serve the mild to moderate. Um, since the implementation of CCBHC, where we've seen numbers really just uh, skyrocket, is that we are now serving a lot of um, the mild to moderate, and actually on HMP. These are individuals that were just sitting on wait lists. For, for months and months and months and months, but now they are coming to see us. And that's, we're seeing a lot of private insurance, some uninsured, 
um, but really in our community, it's the mild to moderate that has really has shown up at our door and has really increased those numbers. And for West Michigan, prior to CCBHC, we had already begun serving the mild to moderate. We had contracts with all the Medicaid health plans to provide those services. So the real increase in penetration for us was in our private insurance community, largely folks coming in um, with substance use disorders and then being diagnosed with kind of co-occurring mental health and substance use conditions and, and moving into our services. So we were, we were joking that it's really interesting that that private insurance number, no matter, even though the size of our communities is dramatically different, for our community that access wasn't there for folks with private insurance at all. Uh, crisis services, we talked a lot about that. Um, just one data point in Washtenaw County prior to uh, CCBHC, our 24-7 uh, phone lines, um, we took about 5,000 calls um, per month. Right, right now we are at 10,000 calls a month. That is how many uh, you know, individuals are contacting us for some type of service or crisis. And what we're also finding is that because it's a lot of the mild and moderate that we're finding, in about 90 days, we can stabilize them and then pass them off to um, the most appropriate uh, provider in the community. We've had similar experience with it since implementation of mobile crisis, more than doubled our crisis contacts. Some of that has also been related to the pandemic um, and increased, we did warm lines and some of those kinds of things and became more available and more visible to the community. Um, but those, those numbers are, they're nowhere near five to 10,000, but we've more than doubled that population. So it used to be about 100, 150 calls. Now it's three, 350, 400 calls a month, so. Next slide, just again, um, how, many, how much more in these, when we say encounters, these are what actually would be what, you know, what I would call the billable encounters. Um, and you can see how those also dramatically rise. The only thing I will add to this slide, you can see um, that, the, you know, again, as we've talked a lot, that these are, that CCBHC is a solution to larger challenges. Um, in Washtenaw County, we are also a behavioral health home that's embedded in our CCBHC. So what that means for us is that within our population, we use data, physical health data through CC360 and some other um, sources to actually target the sickest um, individuals with their, with their physical health needs. And we have specialized services to really do coordination of care to try to address the physical health needs from within our CCBHC system. Um, and that's had you know, dramatic results on the physical health side. The other ma major piece, and I kind of alluded to this a minute ago, was the um, integrated substance use disorder management. The amount of folks coming in our doors with substance use diagnosis and significant need for for treatment and desire for treatment who previously did not have access in our communities um, is really significant it has gone up also dramatically during the pan pandemic but the ability to offer that whole person care to folks with that sub with those substance use um, diagnoses and substance use issues has been really significant and then really the last thing we wanted to highlight um, Many of you, um, and you've brought up the importance of children's mental health as we've, as you guys were doing your discussion at the beginning, um, but many of you are aware that there's also um, a lawsuit in the state around um, children's, um, around children's quality and access to children's services. Um, the, the department's new um, children's department um, has really identified um, four main goals um, and those are bulleted out on this slide. And part of what we wanted to share is that CCBHC actually addresses all four of those major goals and the services that are provided, the coordination of care and that coordination of that safety net benefit are all part of, um, quite frankly, a solution um, relative to um, the challenges in that KB lawsuit. So with that, uh Representative Brabeck, we did our best. It's 1016. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, I think just the last thing I want to say to, before I answer questions is that um, the impact that this has had in our communities, there's no walking this back. Mm -hmm. And I can't stress that enough, that there is no walking this back. So, I, you know, again, thank you so much for having us. I really appreciate your time and attention to this very important matter. Yeah. Um, and happy to answer any questions. Okay. 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate just how comprehensive and learning about the impact uh, is in it, in what can be absolutely transformative uh, is really stark and startling in terms of how and who we're able to now serve. Uh, we have lots of folks who have questions. Um, and one of the things that I'm also wondering before we start with those questions, um, I just want to put a bug in your ear to potentially join us next week via Zoom so you can answer, continue to answer the questions that folks have. Um, uh, because I, we want to be able to do this right. Uh, and uh, and part of that is having these questions answered. So thank you. Right. We're going to start with Rep Glanville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I have a bunch of questions, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> I'll try to limit it. Um, can I ask two? Yes. Okay. So I kind of want to understand, um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of trouble separating CMH from CCVHC. Um, my understanding is that the CMHs are county specific, um, and and so like, can you just real briefly, like, how, how are they separate? Or are they not? We can, yeah, so um, CMHs are created by the counties that, um, that they are formed in. Several CMHs are multi-county CMHs like mine. Um, and what a CCBHC, in my mind, is kind of a CMH plus. <laughs> so, so we offer all the core services and serve all the same populations. We are both a CMH and a CCBHC. So if I'm, so I have, I mean, and I'm in your county, I'm in your service area, but like as a, as a person, just any random person, like I would have access to both of those services? You would, you would come in one door and it would be the whole thing. You Only if a CCBHC existed in my area. Yes. Otherwise, I would have to go to a CMH, which has different. No, no. You don't qualify yeah. for a CMH. That's what I'm saying. Like, I wouldn't qualify for a CMH. I would only qualify for a CCBHC, and if that didn't exist in my area, I wouldn't have access. Correct. Correct. Okay. You could go to a neighboring CCBHC because, again, geography does not matter. But I can't go to a neighboring C CMH. Correct. Okay. Generally right. speaking, that is correct. Okay. Um, I'll stop there with that piece. Um, <laughs> so, um, the other thing I was wondering about is um, with so the funding is so it's grant funded. The CMH is grant funded and the CCBHC is grant funded. CCBHC no. is so federal grant. There, CCBH, there are two types of CCBHCs. The, there's the CCBHCs under the demonstration, which are certified by the state, and those are funded. Um, through a Medicaid payment reform mechanism. So called. those are federal dollars? Those are federal dollars. Okay. CCBHC grants um, exist um, through SAMHSA, and those are time-limited grants that are shorter-oriented. And are those state-funded? No, they're federal-funded also. So they're CCBHC is all federal funding? Yes. So, so it's either okay. funded through SAMHSA grant dollars or through Medicaid dollars that um, come from the feds to, through the state. Okay, and what about the CMHs? How are they funded? They are primarily funded by Medicaid, but there is also some state general fund dollars and then local kinds of state grant dollars like state opiate response, some of those kinds of so things. When or those, millage dollars. So okay. if and when those grant dollars end, mm -hmm. those services end? Not if you're in the demonstration. So if you're in the demonstration, you're funded through the Medicaid reimbursement. Okay. Um, but if you are part of the CCBHC through the SAMHSA grants, you have to have a pathway for those services after the grant expires. But the CM, you said the, I'm sorry, I thought you said the CMH gets some state grants, opiate. Like, oh, yeah, state opiate response. Right, so what happens when those grants end? I mean, that would be an end of service unless we can somehow continue the funding. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and if you want, Representative, I can kind of go through how the money flows and, and works on yeah. this. I mean, off, I don't want to take a off, <laughs> offline. And, yeah. But yeah, it's CCBHC is a is a federal designation yeah. that brings in some additional federal funds. Where our CMHs have, they get you know money through the state from Medicaid. There's a pot of general fund dollars. There's also other categorical areas could where they receive money as could well. Could we get like a but, a little yeah, handout or absolutely. something so the, for the whole group that kind of yep. shows how the money flows? Yep. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. It is very complicated. Thank you, Rep. Glanville. And we will get to your other questions. So not today, but like we will we will get to them. So 
Okay. Minority Vice Chair Smoltz. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the home health models. I'd like to know how that started and, uh, you know, the whole procedure for that. So we don't have to do that now, but if you could give me the information on that. Um, that's very interesting to me. Yes, no, absolutely. I will. Um, yeah, we have some additional information on our behavioral health home and, and opioid health homes and how that works, what they do, how, how they coordinate care for those individuals in the, in that program. And absolutely. how many of those do you have right now? Um, I'm trying to think the number off the top of my head. I know it is all of our CMHs in northern Michigan, all of them in the Upper Peninsula, um, and then there's a handful downstate, Calhoun, Kalamazoo, maybe Wayne County and, and Oakland and, and McCombs, they have different pieces of those. So, I mean, there's probably 15, 20 of them across the state, I want to say off the top of my head. Yes, I'd be interested if you could get me some information on that. And thank you all for your presentation. And um, hopefully, you know, I appreciate all that you do in this uh, area of health care and, and mental health care. And um, we hope to get a lot done. So thank you. So there are several more questions, uh, but we're also running up against time. Uh, so I'm going to ask folks on the committee, if you can think about what we all got to learn today, write your questions down, uh, and I'm going to ask if, you know, potentially to see if our presenters can join us at the beginning of our next committee session, and then we'll be able to ask them all the questions, uh, and then we'll move from there. That's Okay. All right, so... We don't have any folks who are absent, which is great. So I want to say again, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you and to do this work uh, with you and excited about all the possibilities that we will get accomplished in these next two years. So there being no further business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody.